Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Fish of Hex. My name is Travis. Today we're going to be doing a subscriber request video and this one is how do you know if you're ready to start growing Agripora in your reef tank? And uh, I get this question quite often. So in this video, I'm going to be covering an ideal tank setup. We're gonna talk about lighting, par, flow, stability, water parameters, stuff like that. We're gonna move into some starter Acropora, and then also talk about some acros that I would avoid as a beginner. And then finally wrap this video up with talking about maintenance and care and also give you guys some pro tips i wouldn't say pro tips but give you guys some tips on how to be successful starting off with acropora so with that all said let's go ahead and get started okay so let's go ahead and first talk about the ideal tank setup now this is what i would personally do if it was my setup now that doesn't mean that those all-in-one bio cubes or even nano tanks are not capable of growing acropora because they surely can and i've seen a ton of small small beautiful tanks but if you're just starting out you want to give yourself the best chance for success so I would recommend having the largest display that you can fit in your room or you can afford and then also have a sump. Now, the reason why I say to have a sump is because as you start growing SPS and you get a lot of it, you might consider upgrading pieces of equipment, like maybe to a better skimmer. Maybe you want to add a calcium reactor. Maybe you want different reactors for GFO or carbon. Maybe you want to add bio pellets. Maybe you want to just have a bigger refugium. And it's going to be a lot easier to have those things if you have a tank with a sump below that you are able to do those upgrades with. Now I did mention that you should have the biggest tank that you can fit in the room or that you can afford on top of a sump for one reason and one reason only. The more water you have within the system, the more stable that system will be. And it's true. You ask anybody who has a nano tank that tries to keep SPS alive, understand that they have to still have an ATO. They got to keep an eye on things more closely than you would if you were to have 500 gallons because if a little bit of water evaporates, it's not going to be a big deal on a big system. But if the same amount of water evaporates on a small nano tank, you could have major fluctuations with salinity. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And those types of fluctuations can do a lot of damage to your Acropora. All right, now that we've talked about the tank and the sump, let's go to move on to the highly debated subject of lighting. Now, I'm just going to tell you what has worked for me in the past and what I'm currently using now. Now, in the past, I used cheaper lights over the 125, and that was really my first tank of SPS and dabbing into Acropora. So, I was just kind of learning, just like everybody else, I was just kind of learning what worked best. And for that tank, I used cheaper lights. I used some um, Aquamars, um, off of uh, eBay with some SB Reflight PCB boards. And then I used some cheap T5 fixtures that I picked up at the local fish store with Purple Plus and Blue Plus bulbs. Now, the growth in that tank was great. That was actually the tank that I started the channel with. It did very, very well. Um, the coloration was pretty good and overall growth was, was fine. Definitely for the tank only being up for two years before I really, really started uh, hammering it and taking it down to get ready to move. The tank did quite well, and uh, I, I really enjoyed that system. It's actually what made this YouTube channel what it is, so I'm pretty thankful for that system. And um, now that I've upgraded and you know financially things are better and I've kind of turned this into a business, I have upgraded my lighting, of course. Now, currently in the fish room, I have a few different types of lights. So over the 300, we have a retrofit T5 kits with XR15. So right now there's eight XR15s over the 300, and I have uh, four... Uh, T5 bulbs in each one of the two fixtures. Now, I like to use Blue Plus and Actinic for bulbs, and having that mixture of T5 and uh, LEDs with the XR15s really helps with the overall par and spread of light in the 300, and it does just great. You guys seen the growth in that tank. It's been pretty insane. Now, for the rest of the uh, system or fish room here, on my two low boy grow out tanks, I have three XR15s over each one of them, and the growth and coloration is perfectly fine. Now, over my um, grow, or not my grow out tank, my selling tank, I have uh, three Kessel A360Xs, which I will do a video on later on, and um, those are perfect for taking pictures and really uh, getting coral healed up and ready to be sold. And then on top of that, I still have that 40 gallon shallow reef that has four uh, HD Prime LEDs. All this stuff is focused around the AB plus spectrum and the growth is great in that tank as well. Point is, you can get away with cheaper lighting to grow SPS and Acropora without any issues. But if you want the best bang for your buck and overall investment, spending the extra money on lighting is definitely something that I would recommend. Uh, there's two things in the entire setup that I recommend you spend money on, and one is your skimmer, and the other one is your lighting. Everything else can kind of take a back seat as long as you have either backup pumps for your return pump and you have you know extra stuff just in case a heater dies or something like that. But overall, you do get what you pay for when it comes to lighting. So if you want the best, I guess, uh, overall option or success or uh, chances of success there's a word i'm looking for then maybe spending a little bit more more money on lighting would be something that i would recommend 
Okay, let's go to move on to the next important factor for an Acropora reef tank, and that is flow. Again, this is a highly debated topic. I'm not going to get into the numbers and the recommended numbers. I'm going to talk about what has worked for me in the past and what you should try to strive for. Now, when it comes to flow, the more you have, the better off you're going to be. Now, there is such thing as too much flow. If you have so much flow in your tank that you, can, you can't get polyp extension, the corals are growing in a weird direction, then yeah, you might want to dial back a little bit. But overall, if you're not blasting colonies and you can really add a lot of flow bouncing off the back and front walls of the tank and add a little swirling effect, the corals really like that variation. Now, they also like to have mixed upflow. So if you have pulse mode or something like reef crest or something that can really change up the flow instead of it directly blasting at them, that's always gonna be good for polyp extension and growth. Now, the main purpose of having a lot of flow is to promote strong coral structures. Now, if you have a lot of flow, the coral has to build upon that. It has to be able to be stable as it grows and gets bigger. Now, I've found if I have a lot of flow in a reef tank, especially this one with particular colonies, if the, if the flow is really strong, the coral base will be much thicker. It'll take up a lot more of the rock, but it will also be a much bigger colony. I mean, we got some massive colonies in this tank. Some of them are just about to come out of the water. These are bigger than basketballs, and you don't see that very often. And I like to contribute that success because there is a ton of flow. I mean, at one point, I was over 35,000 gallons per hour in this tank, and that was before I started killing off powerheads. You guys know the stories. I've been killing a lot of Jabos, replacing them with the Neros, which are not as much flow, but they're pretty good for the exception of killing some fish. But that's a whole nother topic. We've talked about that in the past. But overall, a lot of flow in a reef tank is going to be great for not only nutrient export if you have a bare bottom tank, but also really, really building those strong coral structures, which is what you want when you're growing big colonies of Acropora. Now, a side note to having very strong Acropora colonies is if you have a bullheaded fish like me with the Vomingi tang, who has ran into pretty much every colony in this tank, and uh, it's held up quite well. There has been some casualties, and I have had lost a big chunks of colonies, but overall, the main base structure has been very strong. Now, uh, will this Vomingi tang be hanging around for the 1,000? I don't know yet. I really want to send her to an aquarium where she can, uh, a big, big aquarium where she can have a good time swimming around without any resistance or coral stabbing her in the face. Uh, in hindsight, I probably wouldn't have added her to this tank given how big she's gotten in such a short period of time. But anyways, let's go to move on to the next important aspect of an Acropora reef tank. Now, this last aspect really isn't so much to do with the tank setup, even though it does kind of coincide. It really has to do with your ability to keep stable water parameters. And we're talking about calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, salinity, temperature, pH, kind of pH. I mean, who, who really focuses too much on pH? But overall, that's a whole other video. We talked about that in the past. And then also your nitrates and phosphates. What is your or how is your ability or are you able to keep stable water parameters? That's really what I'm talking about. If you're struggling with a force of green hair algae or vice versa, you have dino everywhere and it's out of control, it's probably not a good time to get into Acropora. You're probably just going to be wasting your money because most of those corals come from systems that aren't at that extreme in nutrients or lack of nutrients. And if you introduce a coral into that environment, it's probably not going to do well with that adjustment and then die. And um, so the way that I look at it is if you're able to keep a stable reef tank growing, easy SPS, bird's nest, and you don't have a ton of hair algae, maybe a little bit here and there, and you're not overrun with dinos, then yeah, you're probably keeping your water parameters where they should be. And considering diving into some easy um, Acropora would, would be a pretty good idea if that's something that you want to do. All right, so now that we've talked about the ideal tank setup, let's go to move on to some starter Acropora and what I recommend for you guys. Now, before we get into that, I have to reiterate what I mentioned previously because I'm going to hear about it in the comment section regardless of how I say it. But I want you guys to understand that you can be successful regardless of the type of equipment you have in your setup. It just depends on you, really. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, I've had... I've been to the point where I didn't have enough money to buy my own salt to now where I'm able to get whatever I want for my reef tank. I've been on both sides. I've had really cheap equipment, and then I've also had really good equipment, and I've seen success on both sides. Now, of course, I did mention that I've seen a lot more success with the higher end. You get what you pay for equipment, but that does not mean that you can't just start out with some cheaper stuff and be successful. So, so I just want to make sure you guys understood that you can be successful if you are on a budget. It's not end all be all if you can't afford to have radions. So let's go to move on to some starter Acropora. Okay, so when it comes to starter Acroporas, I recommend staghorns and Meliporas for a few reasons. One, staghorns just look awesome as they grow, uh, depending on the type. I mean, that green and purple tip grows like a giant bush upwards towards the light. And then you have like the green slimer that 
does a main branch with a bunch of little branches off. Um, staghorns are just kind of one of my personal fav favorites. Uh, they do have a little bit of movement with their polyps, not like a millipora, but uh, they do have relatively good movement depending on the species. And um, they just seem to be more resistant to flow fluctuations in par, temperature, and stuff like that. And I've sold a lot of both of those species on top of some torts and some uh, smooth skinned acros. And I find that they are more resistant to issues during transit and they seem to adapt a little bit better to newer tanks. So uh, staghorns and milliporas are what I would recommend for a beginner who's looking to get into Acropora. Now, when it comes to Acropora, that you should probably avoid anything that is considered smooth skin. Uh, torts seem to be an issue for me, not so much keeping them alive in my system. I, I do quite well with them, but when it comes to people buying them and them lasting for a long time, DOA is not so much an issue. That means dead on arrival. So during transit, they seem to be fine. But once they get into people's tanks, if they have any kind of major fluctuations in alkalinity and stuff, the tort usually kind of STNs or slow tissue necrosis or even RTNs, which is rapid tissue necrosis, relatively quickly if you have major fluctuations in the tank. So as a beginner, I would stay away from any kind of smooth, uh, smooth skinned coral uh, torts, particularly or something I would kind of avoid. And now the next one is any kind of deep water low light acropora i will put a list here on the screen um, i don't personally have any of those in my tank uh, because i run a ton of light i might consider getting some for the 1000 in some lower light areas just to kind of add the variety but stay away from deep water acroporas they are so temperamental um, if they're not a beginner acro if you have issues with light even just sensitivity wise or par you know if you have fluctuations of par or anything that goes on with light and uh, also temperature you're going to stn or even rtn those guys out relatively quickly so Avoid deep water and avoid kind of really smooth skinned acropores if you are a beginner. Okay, so let's go to move on to the last part of this video, which is going to be general maintenance, care, and tips for success. I guess we'll wrap it all up in one uh, part. Now, when it comes to maintenance, make sure you're doing water changes only if you need to. Now, the reason why I do water changes here in the 300 is just to remove detritus. I've mentioned that before uh, because I'm pretty much giving my tank a water change every single day, shipping coral and replacing it with freshly made salt water. And uh, so I really don't need water changes to, to get nutrients down or to keep water parameters stable. It's simply just to remove detritus so it doesn't look like a mess. Now, if you're struggling with keeping your nutrients at a certain range, say your nutrients are just too high, so your nitrates and phosphates are through the roof and you got to get them down, then consider doing a water change. But be be careful when you do that type of maintenance. You want to make sure you're not doing anything that's going to cause major fluctuations. So don't do 50 or 100% water changes. If you have an issue with your tank, consider doing 30% every other day for a week to really reset the tank. But again, make sure that your temperature is matching, your salinity matches, you're not having any kind of major fluctuations because really at the end of the day, that's what kills Acropora, fluctuations in any extreme. If you go from 7 DKH to 10 DKH in one day, you're probably going to wipe out your Acros pretty quick. And uh, yeah, so make sure your maintenance is on par with keeping your water print stable. Now, when it comes to tips for success, when you first get your Acropora, make sure you know where you got it from, as in uh, make sure that the coral is healthy. If you have a quarantine tank, put it in coral, uh, put it in quarantine, make sure it's pest free, but also make sure you know what kind of light it was um, underneath before, what par range was it in, and try to make sure you imitate that in your main display. The last thing you want to do is take a coral that was in 150 par, which I don't know why it would be, but if you bought an Acro in 150 par and then put it up at 700 par the first day you get it, you're probably going to have an issue and your coral is probably going to STN out really quickly. So try to match the water parameters and par, importantly, from the tank that you had before. Of course, making sure it's pest free. You don't want to have any flatworms, red bugs, or acroporidine flatworms, anything like that. You want to make sure that the coral is uh, sourced, or at least you get it from a reliable source. All right. And uh, I guess other than that, tips for success, take your time. Don't go ahead and buy a thousand frags at one time. I do offer a beginner frag pack or acro pack. Um, it has four basic acropores. It has a, uh, let me click over here, make sure I get it right. Um, it has the green slimer, the WWC yellow tip, the PC rainbow, and the green and purple staghorn, which is very popular. Now, the reason why I picked those four as a beginner is because I've sold thousands of these frags and had very, very little issues with DOA and people having problems with them after keeping them in their tanks for a while. So uh, just make sure you, uh, start off slow don't get a ton of coral maybe a four pack maybe a 12 pack or you know just go slow don't overwhelm your tank with acropora just kind of dip your toes in if you're new and see if you like it if you do then go ahead and expand upon that because one thing about this hobby is it can last forever as long as you're up for it and you're willing to put the time in uh, you don't have to rush this hobby there's no reason why you need to do that so 
With all of that said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or you want to add anything to this, feel free to put in the comment section and let me know below what you think. All right. So until then, I'll see you guys later. And actually not until then because I messed up the outro. <laughs> I will see you guys in the next video because I'm just speaking like a robot over here. So hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll see you guys later. All right. Peace.